Um, I'm even going to time myself. <laughs> okay, so um, hi everybody. Thank you very much for joining me. I actually didn't think so many people would join this session. I'm very, very excited to be here. It's actually my very first time in the Netherlands. And I coincidentally came here. So actually, my uh, colleague, Ferry Wolf, was supposed to be presenting. Unfortunately, he had a bit of an angle injury. So you're going to have to deal with me and my Australian accent. Okay? So uh, my name is Simona Domazatoska. I'm a product marketing manager here at Tricentis. And uh, the title of my presentation is Making Testing Fun, AI Power Test Automation and Self-Healing AI. So really, what I'm going to be talking to you is why did Tricentis make the strategic decision to include artificial intelligence into the product portfolio? Why did we think it was such an important and almost necessary thing, okay? And what was our vision at the time, okay? And where will the future of AI live in the Tricentis platform? So before I do get started, I would like, like to just say that I'm not here alone, actually. I'm joined here by several other Tricentis colleagues. So we have Mar Marco Fogel. He's a solution architect here at Tricentis, and he's going to be showcasing a lot of the live demos of the products and capabilities that I'm going to be talking about today. We also have Peter. He can give you a bit of a customer uh, perspective in terms of what we do here at Tricentis. And I think there may be some others, but I'm not too sure. I think maybe it's just us three. Uh, if you do have any questions, please do ask them, but uh, I will try to make some time at the end, as I have really a lot of content to cover. So let's get started. Here, I want to explain how has test automation evolved over the years. Now, the purpose here is not to give you a history lesson, because I don't want to bore you to death, but really just to give you a bit of an overview on the different tools that are being used even today on the market, and just to give you an idea of where we stand and where we're heading to for the future. So the first generation of test automation was script-based. And script-based used a record and playback solution where you basically put on your recorder, you record throughout your business process, and you play it back. And so some of the tools here were Mercury Interactive. And unfortunately, this approach was quite fragile, as any changes made to the automation, uh, to the application would break the uh, scripts. And so that required a lot of programming resources in order to fix those scripts. And not only that, but you were getting automation rates of about 0 to 20%. So it, wasn't, it was quite resource heavy and maintenance heavy. Um, the first generation also introduced test automation frameworks. Now, I'm sure you're all aware these are some of your commercial and open source tools in the market, like your Seleniums, your HP, Boraland, Cypress, and so on and so forth. Um, and so what test automation scripts did is that they broke down the individual snippets of code and put them into components into test framework structures. And whilst that did improve the reusability of the test case, the test maintenance pr uh, problem was still persisting. It's still perpetuated. Unfortunately, any changes made to the application would uh, require a lot of uh, maintenance in terms of fixing them. And so what happened is um, the next generation evolved to model-based test automation. And this was something Tricentis introduced to the market. It was pioneered by our founder, Wolfgang Platz. He was working as a strategic consultant back in the day um, in uh, Allianz. And he was basically tired of seeing all these automation scripts that were breaking. So what he decided to do is build model-based testing. And this is a much more efficient way of testing because it decouples the test cases from the automation model, such as the test data and the test logic. And you're able to maintain your test cases in a human-readable, low-code, no-code platform that anybody can use and adopt. So what that means is that companies can now make use of their business users, their non-technical testers, to be able to use automation across the enterprise. Not only that, but we have customers Customers who are achieving repeatable 90% uh, automation rates, which is, which is highly transformative. And in order to continue this trend, we decided to introduce artificial intelligence. But why? Why did we decide to do that? Well, it's not just test automation that has evolved, but it's also technology. So I'm not a developer. 
okay? But I speak to a lot of developers at my company and a lot of developers at customer sites, and I ask them, how has technology changed? You know, what have you have had to learn in order to stay competitive? And so a lot of developers tell me that back in the day, the most popular programming language, one that would be the most critical to the future of their success, would be C-sharp. No application would be built without C-sharp, right? So all your thick clients and your mainframes were going away, and suddenly all the apps would be built in C-sharp. But it turns out that they weren't quite right, because then service-orientated architectures appeared. Right? And so that was the coolest new kid on the block, SOA and XML. And so um, everybody started to, or wanted to rewrite their thick client applications into uh, service oriented arch architectures, because that was apparently the future. But it turns out that they also weren't quite right because then mobile was the next big thing, right? And so suddenly we had to build uh, mobile applications, we had to learn how to uh, write mobile applications in Java, we had to build apps in OSs and different mobile phones. But then soon after that, microservices emerged, okay? So, now we had to, uh, you know, all these monolithic applications and big applications were no longer cool. And we started to build apps in these loosely coupled microservice architectures that are running in containers, in Kubernetes, and in Dockers. And some of these names I can't even spell, <laughs> right? And so, um, even if you look at the web, the way that the web has evolved over the years, you'll see that the, the languages used to build the web applications have changed, right? So we went from JWT, and not a year later, that wasn't cool anymore, and then we went to XJS, Knockout, Angular, and so on and so forth. And so, if you look at the advancement of technology, You'll think for a second, you'll ponder, and you'll be like, Houston, we have a problem. And that problem is called the technology Stockholm Syndrome. I'm not sure if you've heard this term before. What this means is that we are, we are imprisoned by an ever-changing landscape of technology. And for some people, it's very fun. Right? Because you're constantly learning something new, you're having to learn new programming languages, but for other people, it's not so much fun. And the part about it that is the least fun of all is the testing, okay? The testing is not so fun. Well, why isn't it so fun? Well, if you're writing your test, uh, test cases manually, then you won't be able to keep up with this rate of rapid technological change, right? Even with test automation frameworks, sure, it will work initially, you will save some time and effort, but as soon as the application changes, as soon as your testing increases in scope, then all your selectors are gonna grab, your test cases are gonna break, all those JavaScripts that you built executing certain test events are going to break, and so really, testers fall into this maintenance trap. Not just a maintenance trap, but they might avoid doing automated tests in, in the first place to begin with, okay? And so really, that leads to stagnation and to delayed projects. And delayed projects mean that companies have to invest even more money and resources in order to put those projects over the deadline. And so really, it's just not fun writing the same, uh, same tests and having those same tests fail. It's not run, uh, fun having a new application being built and the first feeling hitting you in the stomach being, oh my gosh, all my regression tests are going to break, right? And it's not fun when everybody in your team comes running after you saying, the, the build has broken and all the tests have broken, right? So um, definitely there were some problems there. So um, we had to do something different, right? That's what we did. Okay, so we took a step back at Tricenters and we started to think. We started to wonder, is it just us? Are we hyperactive? Are we a little bit too much? Do we just need to be patient? Do we need to slow down? Okay, but it turns out our customers agreed with us that test automation has problems, 
okay? And so what we did is we sent out a bunch of survey surveys, we consulted a lot of our um, partner organizations, industry professionals, and we even shamelessly looked at other companies' test automation reports, and really it came loud and clear that test automation has problems. Now, this is the business reality of testing and some of these figures you have probably come across. The World Quality Report tell, tells us that testing is very, very expensive. In fact, it costs companies an average of about 25% of their IT budget. That's very expensive, okay? And the reason why it's expensive is because we need to be better, we need to be faster. Our current approaches to testing are, are inefficient. Even if you look at the GitLab DevOps report, it uh, tells you that the number one problem to uh, software uh, not being delivered on time is testing. And finally, companies aren't really averaging high automation rates. We're seeing at Tricenter's figures of only about 20% automation t uh, uh, rates, especially as you go across your end-to-end -end testing. So what we decided to do is, once we conducted all this research, we decided to break it down into three buckets. These are the three automation challenges. Automation is fragile, so some of the common responses we got, as we heard, test cases are breaking, they're costly to maintain, but really, the underlying issue was that the rate of application change was so fast that test automation was just not able to keep up. The second problem, Automation is too technical. Now by this, I don't just mean that automation requires coding. What I mean is that in order to be able to automate an application, you really need to understand the underlying technical characteristics of that application, okay? So let me just give you uh, an example. If you're trying to automate a React application, then you need to know something about the DOM structure. If you're trying to automate something like Angular, then you really need to know about the custom HTML elements, okay? Um, if you're trying to automate something like WebAssembly, then, uh, uh, then you need to know the compiled web, right? So that's just within the domain of web, okay? What about API? What about desktop? What about mobile? So if we dive into API, REST is completely different to gRPC. And so really, that's where the technical challenge lies, is that you really need to learn the application's technical dynamics in order to achieve effective automation. And finally, the last problem, we don't know what is most important, okay? So think about it. There is a change in your application. You have no idea which test to run. You don't know what is most important. You have very short amount of time. You can't run your whole regression set. So you really need to understand what are those critical tests. We all know tests are not created equal, right? And we can't test everything. We need to test what matters most first. Luckily, we solved that problem at Tricentis with uh, uh, Life Compare. We added that to our portfolio. So what is Live Compare? Uh, Live Compare is smart impact analysis, and that is available for SAP and also for Salesforce today. We just released that uh, for Salesforce as, a, as an, a tech preview. And so what Live Compare does is that it looks at your SAP world, and it tells you when there is, an, uh, when there is a change, these are the most tests, uh, important tests that you need to run. And these are the test cases that are missing that you need to build and that you need to run to cover those application changes. Okay, so really what Life Compare does is that it saves you a lot of time from having to build test cases that are just not useful. Okay, so that's great. But what about these two problems? The fragility and the technicality. Well, we have gone through uh, to some extent in solving that with Tosca, but the pr problem still persists, especially when it comes to UI automation. So we took a step back. And we asked ourselves, why aren't our users having problems keeping up with our application changes? Now that's a little bit confusing. It requires like a, a bit of a mind shift to understand what that actually means. Have a look at, I'll give you an example, Amazon website, okay? 
Let's say that in the Amazon website, the register button moves from the top right navigation corner into the bottom left box or something like that. Your, your user is not going to come running to you saying, oh my gosh, I can't find the register button. Everything has broken. No, they're not. They're going to be able to tell that the register button is the register button regardless of the layout, regardless where, where it is on that page. Okay? And so that is what we asked ourselves at Tricenters. We said, can we make our tests just as adaptable as our users? But then it turns out we had another problem, okay? So everybody have a look at this. What is this? I mean, it's a bunch of HTML code on a page, right? So the technically astute amongst you might figure out this could be a drop-down, maybe. Or it could be an input field, right? We're not too sure. It's very difficult to tell what this is. But let me show you this. Ah, well, that's very easy to understand. That's a simple drop-down. It's an insured drop-down, okay? So our brains are able to process that information in a matter of milliseconds, because that's how users work. We look at a, if there is a UI change on the application, we don't care. We don't care about the layout or the design. We're still able to tell where different elements are on a web page. The code, on the other hand, is a lot more complicated. If we want to recognize controls by simply looking at the technical layer, then we can't do that, okay? Because HTML alone can be used to form a drop-down in many different ways. And so teaching technology how to identify all those different ways is just really complex and not very efficient. So what did we decide to do? Well, we asked ourselves, can we teach test automation uh, to understand user interfaces the same way as human do, uh, humans do? Can we teach it to recognize a drop-down as a drop-down by simply just looking at it? Well, this is how Vision AI emerged. Okay? So Vision AI is our next generation AI-powered test automation engine in Tosca. And what it does is that it automates UI, UI op applications, remote and virtual desktop applications, uh, cloud-native applications, and even simple design and mock-ups before any code is written. Okay, good, but let's, let's look into it. How does that actually work? Well, we decided that, you know, in order to make this work, we needed a couple of different pieces of technology. The first piece of technology we needed was intelligent object detection. So what do we mean by that? Basically, Vision AI is an automation driver that works using AI, in particular neural network technology, in order to see elements on a page just like a pair of human eyes. But what are neural networks and how do they work exactly? I'll get to that in a bit. Second thing we needed was self-healing execution. We needed to test execution to be a lot smarter. Test cases were breaking. Um, we didn't know why, you know, fragile object identification, that's a really common problem. I'll get to that part as well in a bit. And then finally, the last piece is that we wanted to make it really, really easy to use. So easy that your grandmother can even create test automation. And so that's also a huge problem because if you look at the World Quality Report of 2021, it tells you that Currently, there is a huge gap between how advanced a test automation tool is and the skill set needed in order to implement it, okay? And so companies are advised to adopt a strategy in order to lower the dependency on the skill set by adopting tools that are a lot more inclusive. Okay, let's start with neural networks. So I don't want to give you a crash course on neural networks, but really the purpose here is just to help you understand how vision AI works. Now. AI machine learning, what's the difference? So broadly speaking, AI is an umbrella term, and machine learning is a subcomponent of it. And AI means performing any intelligent human task that would otherwise require a human to do. Machine learning, on the other hand, is a system that continuously learns and improves over time, given more experience. Okay? So let me give you an example. 
This example will also explain what's the difference between an algorithm and a machine learning system. Okay, so say you need to figure out the fastest route possible from A to B. So with a machine learning system, you know the problem, which is A, and you know the solution, which is B, but you don't know the part in the middle, which is how to get there. That's the part that the machine learning system needs to learn. An algorithm, on the other hand, is an expert instructing the system how to get from A to B. And so therefore an algorithm is only as smart as the expertise and the knowledge that we build into it, okay? Great, but how does that work and what does that exactly mean? Well, look at neural networks. So consider the task of catching a bull, right? A bull comes towards your eyes and your a motoric neural response is to catch that ball, right? And you improve your ability to catch that ball with time based on the outcome. So if the ball smacks you in the face, you're going to get hurt, right? And then you will know for next time, don't do that. So your, neuro, your neurons are being reconfigured, and that's literally how neural networks work in a very, very similar way to the, um, to the human brain. And so what that means is, let me just highlight, m machine learning is when you feed the system with a set of problems and solutions, and you reward and punish the system based on the outcome. If the response is correct, then you tell, you reward the system, and it reinforces and strengthens those neural networks and it remembers them for next time. If it gives an incorrect answer, then it, it, you, you basically punish the system and the, the system has to reconfigure and remodel those internal pathways before it finally arrives to the correct answer. And the important thing here is that machine learning systems require lots and lots of data, okay? Lots of labeled data. And it does this process about thousands and thousands of times a day before it's able to correctly identify most objects and labels. Okay, great. So I hope I didn't bore you to death by uh, machine learning systems, but now I'd want to give you an overview. How does Vision AI actually work? Okay. We used to call it Neo, by the way. Now it's called Vision AI. So uh, what you see here is a very quick demo at the top is a video pulled from YouTube, and it's showing Microsoft ServiceNow. The bottom is a dev view of Vision AI, and what Vision AI is doing here is it's labeling all the different controls. It's spotting them, scanning them, identifying where they are. So as you can see here, Vision AI is able to deal not just with complex controls, um, like inputs, tables, uh, tab bars, and so on, but really complex situations. What do we mean by that? So if you open a drop, a drop uh, uh, if you press on a drop down, you need to be able to identify the different elements within that drop down. If you scan and scroll down a page, you need the AI to dynamically scale, scan all the different contents within that page. But then we ran into another problem, and that problem was text recognition, okay? We can't always guarantee that we're gonna have access to the text because it could be streamed through Citrix or through hard to access applications. What we needed was an optical character recognition technology that would be so fast, it would work at the speed of sight. Unfortunately, most OCRs available on the market today by, built by these big tech giants and that are on the cloud operated about one to five seconds um, every time they find and recognize a control. So let me just give you an example. You type something in an input field and you click submit one. That's pretty slow, okay? If I did that for five seconds, you would be all bored to death. You would want to run out of here. Okay, so we needed an OCR technology that would be a lot more faster. So what did we do? We built our own. We pioneered our own OCR. It is a patented, patented design that works at 70 milliseconds. That's pretty fast, okay? That's faster than you can blink. And so really that was the key behind enabling uh, the neural networks to work at the same speed as your eyes do when looking at different elements on a, on a screen. 
Okay, great. Well, that sounds all great and lovely, but what does that actually mean to you? What does it mean to us? Well, here are a bunch of different use cases that, where you can use Vision AI. Let's start with the first one. You can build automation before your UI exists. Well, what does that mean? Let's have a look at a typical sprint. Think about it. What is the first thing that gets built in a typical sprint, right? It's your mock-up. It's the design of the application, okay? In this phase, testers have nothing to do. They are in a state of inertia. That's not where test automation needs to be. Test automation needs to be happening much earlier into the uh, sprint life cycle. It needs to be happening at the same time as development. And so what you can do with Vision AI is you can use it to build test automation based on a simple mock-up of an application. And you can, use that test, uh, uh, you can use that test case as the application evolves and develops. I'm going to demo that in a little bit. And what this enables is an extreme shift-left approach to UI testing at the speed of DevOps. So let's have a little look at a little demo. So we're going to start with a mock-up. What you see here is a PDF document. And now, what we're going to do is we're going to create a Vision AI module in Tosca. What this means is we're going to scan the PDF document. There you go. We select it, and we select Vision AI, because that's the engine that we want to use. And we click Scan. This is the current XScan functionality we have in Tosca. It works the same way as it currently does with Tosca. We select all the different controls that we want to steer, and then we save that information. That information gets saved as a module, and you drag and drop your module onto your test case in order to perform the automation. I know that Marco would, will, will demo that a little bit later down the track. OK, great. Now, what you will see here is Vision AI successfully running that test case against the mock-up. So here it is. We execute our test case. It doesn't enter any data, obviously, because it's just a PDF document. And there you have it. Vision AI has successfully uh, run that test case based on a simple design or a sketch. OK, so you might be thinking, well, that sounds great. But what happens when your application upgrades, right? Um, what happens when it gets fully developed into a web application? You need to rewrite your whole tests, right? Well, not, re not really, okay? So let's have a look at an example. We're going to use that same test case that we just created for the PDF document, and we're going to run that same test case, no modifications made to it, on the fully developed web application. So what you see here is the vehicle insurance ap application, and here we enter all the data, and there you have it, your test case successfully ran. All the different data inputs were entered into that application. That's the fully built web application that was based on that original PDF document. Okay, now let's move on to Citrix. This requires a bit more. So we all know that um, Citrix is basically a remote uh, and a virtual, uh, it's, it's basically an application that gets hosted in a remote environment, right? We all know that. And it's very difficult to create test automation on Citrix. Why? Because the only thing that you see is an image. All you see is a video. You, you have no access to the technical layer. That's why it's very, very challenging. But with Vision AI, it, does, we, it doesn't care because it screen, it basically it automates whatever it sees. What about old and modern technologies? So for example, when we talk about old technologies, we could be referring to Gupta or WPF, right? We could be referring to deprecated technologies like Silverlight or Flash or some of these other old ones. That's not a problem for Vision AI. It's still able to automate them as long as it has access to the UI. Same thing with very highly modern technologies and very exotic applications like Blazor, Electron, and Flutter, and so on. Vision AI doesn't care. So what that means is that you don't need to do heavy customization in order to make your test automation work when dealing with those applications. 
Okay, great. So I'm going to give you an example. We're going to run that same test case that we created earlier, but this time in Citrix. What you see here is the remote desktop application, and here is the .NET version of that same application. And there you have it, Vision AI again successfully runs the test case. There are no modifications made to that test case. So it was able to go from a PDF document to a .NET version to a fully developed web UI application without any changes made to it. Okay, so you might be thinking, wow, okay, that sounds really, really great. Uh, so one other component to highlight is that it's really, really easy to use. Okay, so we did a test with internal customers, and they were able to create a Vision AI test case under two minutes, which is pretty darn fast. But still, regardless of you know, this great technology, there are still some controls that Vision AI does have trouble recognizing out of the box. So what do we do there? Well, that's where you can help you can contribute to the process of teaching Vision AI and training Vision AI to recognize controls out of the box. So, how does that work exact exactly? What you see here are different tables. Now, the table on the left, that brown table, is what Vision AI could not recognize out of the box. So we're going to teach Vision AI to recognize it, and we're going to do that using this functionality called, oops, user identified controls. Oh. And this is how it works. I hope this one will work. <laughs> no? Oh, sorry. How do I press play? Okay, here we go. So we use XCAN, we click on create user identified controls. Yes. And here you see a visual AI assistant opening. We're going to draw a box around the table or the control that Vision AI cannot recognize. And what we do now is we set anchors, right? So the anchors are what will identify that table in the, in the future. We give that control a name. And we say that this is a table so that Vision AI will be able to treat this control like a table in the future. And we specify the application more concretely. Here we say it is a HTML table styler. And we save that information. After we save that information, we're prompted. Should we rescan? Yes. And as you can see here, there you have it. Vision AI is now able to identify that table, and we did that by setting those anchor points, which are going to be uh, basically the, the anchor points to identify that control in the future. And as you can see here, you can expand it, and you can see all the different individual elements within that table that you can steer, like your rows and your columns and so on. Great, okay, so I don't think we have too much time, but I'm going to skip this next section. What I just wanted to highlight here is that, well, what if you're not using Tosca? What if you're using open source tools? Not a problem, because with Vision AI, we integrate with um, uh, VS Code, which is one of the most popular open source code editors out there on the market. And so what you see here is actual um, a really complicated test uh, automation, uh, test, a test case, and it's automating SAP Fury. Now we all know that SAP Fury is a bit <laughs> difficult to automate because it's got a lot of pages, a lot of text, a lot of different tab bars, and complicated controls. So Vision AI is able to integrate with VS Code and run against those um, executable demands. Oops. Okay, um, let's now move on to self-healing AI. As I mentioned earlier, we recently launched this with Tosca's 14.3. It's available for both our Vision AI and our T-Box engine. Why do we need it? Well, didn't we just say that 
AI-powered automation works already. Like if an OK button changes in color or shape or position, Vision AI will be able to detect that. However, if it significantly changes, that is when we also need Vision AI to kick in. And that can happen when you have rapid releases, bug fixes, or UI changes. Um, and the way that it works is that um, self-healing AI tracks historic executions, and from those it generates a stable identifier that could be used in the future when uh, a test case would fail. And so um, these are some of the benefits that you can of course enjoy with self-healing AI. You're able to increase your test case stability because you have far less test execution disruptions. You can reduce flaky test cases, right? Those are test cases that you don't know whether it was an application failure or something else, and you can save considerable time and effort. How do you enable it? Well, data storage in our cloud is required, so we will need access to some of the test execution data in order to be able to perform that. That is why it's available as an opt-in feature. Okay, which means you need to contact your Tricentis customer representative to enable that. Our um, future roadmap will be to integrate both approaches, okay, um, in order to bring test uh, automation resilience to the next level. Finally, what I want to cover here, so we've done, we've covered vision AI, we've covered self-healing AI to some extent. <laughs> we've also covered a risk AI, which is our life compare solution, as I mentioned. It's our smart uh, impact analysis solution. But really, the point that I want to emphasize here is that our strategy at Tricentis is to embed AI and machine learning across the platform in order to make testing as easy as possible for our users. Because really that's our mission and vision at Tricentis. We want to make testing as fun as possible. We want to remove all the maintenance problems and all the nitty gritty issues that testers have to deal with when it comes to testing. And so we're going to continue to research and innovate in this field and hopefully provide you with as much value as possible. Finally, just to summarize, these are some of the uh, benefits that you can expect with Vision AI. You can test a lot sm sooner, test smarter, and test more. So as we mentioned, with Vision AI, you have an extreme left, a shift left approach to testing by building those test cases on the mockups. You can increase your flexibility and resilience with self-healing AI, and finally, it's very uh, suited to enterprise, uh, large enterprise customers that are dealing with very complex, both old and modern applications. If you want to learn more, here are a couple of resources I recommend that you check out. Next week, uh, we have the Tricentis Virtual Summit. I don't know if you guys know what this is, but it's a global conference that we host twice per year. And we're going to have our Vice President of Machine Learning, Dave Colwell, give a presentation about AI. So I really highly recommend you check it out. And finally, uh, as I mentioned earlier, please come and share your testing story with us. Um, we'd be more than happy to give you a more in-depth overview on how that works. I know I, I rushed through a lot of aspects, but it's because of lack of time. Um, but we would be more than happy to go through that with you. So thanks very much for your attention. And um, if you have any questions, please shoot away. <laughs> Yeah. You showed that uh, Vision AI works for UIs. We also have a lot of APIs in our company. So, uh, can Vision API also work there? And how? Like, uh, yeah, so Vision AI does, is not for non UI testing, it's solely for UI testing. So, you would, for Tosca, for example, you would use um, API engine to create your test cases. But that's a really good point because um, when you're looking at how an application evolves with time, first it's your mock-up, but then it's also your API layer. So you would be using, for example, in Tosca, the API engine to create your test cases. Yeah, but thanks. But there are situations where you don't have the mock-up, right? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Uh, sometimes not created, so then mm. uh, you're still a bit 
Yeah. Then, if the mock-up is not there, yeah. where in the process uh, can you use Vision AI at the earliest? So those use cases that I demonstrated are some of the use cases that we use. So, for example, um, sometimes even in Tosca, there are certain technologies that are very old and we can't build automation out of the box. So we would use or try to use Vision AI for that. And definitely with remote and desktop virtual applications, uh, uh, sorry, applications hosted on VDIs and so on. So those are some of the core use cases where you would use uh, Vision AI. But bear in mind, you know, uh, there are many ways you can shift left as, you, as you've highlighted, right? So you've got API testing, you've even got service virtualization, right? That's another, another approach. But any other questions? Don't be shy. <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, hello, my Hi. name is Jan. And uh, you talk about uh, machine learning, the, you need a lot of data, but, but can you explain more about a lot of data? What does it say? Yeah, that's a really important point. Um, actually, you require a human to label the data, and that is actually a very time-consuming process. And this is quite an interesting topic, very interesting for me personally, because I do believe that we need testers to participate in the process of testing the AI and the machine learning system itself. Mm -hmm. So what does that mean is that testers' jobs, I, I believe, might sometimes need to adapt. Uh, we didn't talk about testing AI. So I think it is very important that, um, that you know, once the AI system gets all this label data, we need to constantly update the system. And, and so I, th I believe testers should participate in that process of, of um, you know, testing the AI itself, right? I hope that answers your question. Yeah, OK. I have another question. Yeah. With the mic now? Yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, I also want to talk about data, but test data. Mm -hmm. uh, like an essential, essential part of test automation to make it successful is also the use of test data. So uh, you showed an example where first you automated it with using the PDF, and then there was a real version, and suddenly all the data was there, like BMW. So how did you take care of the data in that example? And um, that's yeah. a real, yeah, that's a really good question. And my my colleague um, Marco will also happily show that to you. But what what happens in Tosca is that your test data is completely separate uh, to your test steps. You input that test data. It's it's completely decoupled. Okay, and so you we have certain action modes. I know this is actually a bit, bunch of Tosca jargon that I'm saying to you right now, but say you want to verify a, pre, a price in an online shopping <coughs> process, you would use you have the ability to save data by using this thing called the buffer functionality, and you you can recall that later. Um, in order to validate, and it's it's actually a real, it's like a decoupled approach. But with test data, I know it's a huge issue. We even have um, this solution called test data service. So let's just say you have an Excel sheet with a lot of data that you want to use for your test case. You upload that into test data service, and then you use Tosca to fetch that data and use it dynamically in your test cases. Okay, yeah. So any other questions? I don't know what the time is here, but... One minute. One more minute. <laughs> yes? I had a problem with a, a pop-up calendar. <coughs> and, and a person can just say, I want that date to implement, to, to choose, but how Fission AI, AI can do that? With pop-ups? Yes, a pop-up calendar. A pop-up calendar. Hmm. How is Vision AI able to detect a pop-up? and choose the right date. Choose the right date. Ah, that's a really, um, I, so again, that go, it's very similar and connected to this gentleman's question. <laughs> um, Tosca has this thing called dynamic dates. And, and what that does is you have the ability to, it, it, you basically enter like a math function. You say DD, YY, plus two and so on, it's, I can't specifically tell you, but let's just say you want two years in the future, you have the ability to dynamically create dates within Tosca. So you don't put static data into your test case, but dynamic data. So if today's date, what is today's date? I don't know. 
It's the 5th of October. So if you want to use the 5th of October in your test case, you, you have the ability to, to do that dynamically in Tosca. Again, I think our solution architect, I hope Marco um, can demonstrate that, right? Yeah, come to the booth, I'll show you a bit more. Uh, <laughs> I hope that answers your question. I could not implement uh, the date directly into the field because there was something written already in it and it did not overwrite correctly. So I had to choose from the calendar pop-up. Okay. Maybe you can show us what you wanted to do and we can happily look into it. Yeah. One more question. Sure, go for it. I, I you know, I'm, I'm <laughs> for this. <laughs> so we, we have applications uh, within our company. Uh, we're from uh, Irfan Scalem, by the way, uh, which uh, we try to automate. But uh, let's say the, the technology which is out there cannot read the technical background of the, like, let's say, the objects. Mm -hmm. So if I understand correctly, AI vision should be able to recognize the objects, the elements on the UI without actually looking at the technical code or whatever, without exactly. access to that. So exactly. that should be possible. Yes, yes, yes. So that's what Vision AI does. It's, it's able to identify different types of controls by having a, been trained on lots and lots of data, right? Like, this is an input field. This is a button. This is a table. This is a drop-down. This is, you know, there's so many different control types. So that's, what, that's how Vision AI would, would work that it doesn't look at the technical layer at all. It would just automate it based on that knowledge of all the data that it has. And that's just uh, for controls, but then you've also got text, which is a bit more complex, so, you know. Okay, so, great, thanks, Amanda. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, great. Giving you a very warm applause. Thank you. And thank you for all the information. Thanks very much. <laughs> thank you. All righty.